I had the great pleasure and honor of um, conducting a conversation with Manuel Montes, one of the best development economists uh, today, uh, someone from the Philippines who brings a lot of professional and personal experience uh, to his work. He's been uh, at the UN for many decades and now is a senior advisor to the South Center in Geneva on finance and development. And really the objective of the conversation with Manuel was to think through how to regulate global finance by um, essentially domesticating capital. What does Manuel mean by this? Essentially he means by this that it's not enough just to pass laws or uh, certain regulations. We also need new institutions and new practices in order to reconnect global finance to the real economy. But the starting point of our conversation was that the financial crash, as we saw in 2008-9, and the recession that is still unfolding in some parts of the world, is not just a one-off event, nor is it just an accident. Rather, it once again underlies the fact that we have periodic crises of capitalism. Now here it's also crucial to distinguish capitalism from the market economy. Because what's different with capitalism is that it essentially works by abstraction and speculation. It increasingly abstracts from the real economy, it extracts from the social relations that embed markets, and tries to generate short-term profit by essentially speculating in asset prices using diverse financial instruments. So if you like, it's an, an inverted pyramid with basically increasingly abstract layers that are increasingly removed from uh, agriculture, industry, and manufacturing. And so what we see is that finance becomes increasingly self-referential. It's all about derivatives. It's all about uh, speculating in financial instruments that represent just monetary value. But of course, ultimately, finance is also secured against real assets. It has to be. This is where finance begins to pervade the real economy and then dislocates all these social relations that embed uh, productive relations. So that's one important point, that we can distinguish capitalism from the market economy, and we can certainly do much more to make finance once again serve the interests of the real economy and of all the communities who are looking to meet their own interests and needs. The other point that Manuel makes, which is very important for the understanding of the current crisis, is that it could have been prevented, it could have been anticipated, because there was a dress rehearsal for the global crisis, and that was the East Asian crisis of 1997. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what exactly happened then, how it foreshadowed the events of the last few years, but the point is policymakers and uh, politicians did not learn the lessons of the East Asian crisis. And that's why we had a much bigger crisis a few years later. Now, that should serve as a warning sign for today. And this is why uh, our conversation in this book, and of course the book more generally, will hopefully help policymakers and politicians not to repeat the same mistakes again in a few years' time. We're already seeing the build-up of new bubbles, credit bubbles, real estate bubbles, and hopefully we can put in place reforms to prevent another crisis in a few years. And this is really now what I want to focus on in the last couple of minutes, what to do about this current system. And the current system really can be summarized very briefly as a system that privatizes profit, nationalizes losses, and socializes risk. That is to say, profit only ever accrues to very few private interests. Losses are essentially borne by people through bailouts of banks and through recessions that, of course, uh, then drive up uh, public deficits and debt. And risk is socialized. That is to say, the risk is now spread throughout society and doesn't just affect the economy, but also politics and social relations. That is why our world is so interdependent and we've become so exposed to systemic risks, economic risks, financial risks, but also risks like uh, epidemics and indeed political risks. Now, what to do about this? And essentially, Manuel proposes three steps. The first is reforming global governance, because clearly the international system does not represent the people of this world. It is essentially one that was built after the Second World War and still serves the interests of those countries, but not really the emerging markets and developing countries more generally. So we need to build new ways of making decisions in the World Bank, the IMF, and all the other institutions that exist. But we also need to promote regional cooperation, because the response to globalization, and as Richard has indicated, 
it's perhaps a model that's already in terminal crisis, the response can't be to globalize more, but in fact it has to be to re-embed the economy in these relations that make up communities and countries. So regional cooperation, uh, not just the European Union, which is itself in a very serious crisis, but also new initiatives, medical school in Latin America, ASEAN and Asia, and of course the Eurasian Economic Union as it's beginning to take shape. The second point is reforming the banking system, so that banking is again about lending for businesses who then invest that money in production. Now that might sound very banal, but it's an important point because at the moment banks aren't lending to the businesses that need it most. Banks are hoarding cash, they're investing it on the stock market, we have commodity bubbles as a result, and that has to change. And we need new instruments to encourage lending going to the small and medium-sized businesses that need it most. Large corporations have enough cash themselves, so they don't, they're not the ones who need banks. It's the smaller businesses, the family businesses, new startups, very often micro-businesses just run by one or two people. And finally, we need to think very hard about industry and high-tech manufacturing, because that is what generates real value. Finance itself doesn't generate value by itself. It cannot do so. It's an important instrument. It brings investors and savers together, but it needs to serve productive purposes. And what Manuel really does in all of the conversations to show how Keynes has got answers which are not even those of the neo-Keynesians today, but Keynes was far better about how to reconnect finance to the real economy that a lot of uh, contemporary neo-Keynesians uh, are able to articulate. So if you have an interest in Keynes rather than Keynesianism, uh, I can recommend this conversation very, very much to you. Thank you very much.